five, four, three. All right, so welcome to Channel 9. Can you introduce yourself and tell us where Thank we you. are. What's going well, on here? So we're on the fifth floor of the Smith Tower, which is wow. Seattle's, uh, it was Seattle's tallest skyscraper. In fact, I think the tallest skyscraper in West Kansas City when it was built in the, <laughs> uh, the first part of the 20th century. Nice. And uh, so this, this fifth floor got, got renovated very beautifully for us by Microsoft. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Blaise Agueda Yarkas, the, um, the architect of um, one of the architects in the, in the Live Labs group. And I, I founded a company called Sea Dragon. We were acquired at the, at the end of 2005. Okay. And um, we moved in here just a couple of weeks ago. All uh, right. We, uh, we started off in, in, a, in a loft in Ballard. All right. So. Very nice digs. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. It's sort cool. of, you know, Matrix Victorian. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that. It's excellent. So, um, tell me about the technology that you're, you're architecting. Sure. So this is this is some of our dowry. So what we what we came to Microsoft with is, is the Sea Dragon technology. Okay. And this is really what caught the attention of, of Gary Flake, the uh, the founder of Live Labs, the technical fellow. He so he started up Live Labs and he really drove the acquisition of our company. Okay. And uh, this is this is some of what some of what it can do. So this is a, a collection of a few hundred photos. Um, Oh, mm -hmm. okay. maybe we better not. Uh, yeah. That's fine. Let's, let's, let's restart this one. It's cool. That always happens. I mean, only only when you're demoing. Only of course. Demoing. Only when you're demoing on camera. Exactly. Nice. Very cool. Okay. So, collection of of um, a few hundred images, and these are all um, kind of zoomable and panable. Uh, these are these are a few megapixels each, but but the, one of the beautiful things about this architecture is that um, uh, there's there's our there's our fearless acquirer. Gary. <laughs> um, one of the one of the cool things about this architecture, though, is that it allows you to interact with with objects of arbitrary size. So this one this one is a, is a map that's in the uh, in the dozens or maybe maybe even a hundred megapixels. It's really high resolution, nice. and it, it really makes no difference. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the beautiful things about this model for interaction with objects is mm -hmm. that um, you, you're only loading what you need at any given moment. So yeah. it's, it's more, like, more like virtual Earth in that sense than like a, a classic kind of application model in which you, you decouple the opening of a document from navigation inside the document. You're doing both at the same time. Interesting. So you're, so, you're navigating on an image. That's right. So in this case, I'm navigating the image. Whatever, oh. whatever I'm navigating to is what's getting loaded. If I'm, if I'm zooming in, it's loading the high resolution content. I see. And as I zoom out, it's only okay. loading the low resolution stuff. So that, that's why it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how big an object is. Interesting. So, so you must be using um, vectors. Uh, using well, vector graphic algorithms, or, or it's a combination. Actually, these guys, these guys are all are all uh, raster imagery, although they're multi-resolution huh. raster imagery. Nice. Um, this is uh, this is this is some of our team, this, as well as some newcomers uh, out in front of our, our old um, our old loft in Ballard. Huh. That's, that's before we moved. Here's an example of something that, that's a little bit more vectorish. This is um, this is all of Bleak House, the, the whole book. Wow. So um, you know, here you can see this is, this is definitely. <laughs> Vectorish when we when we zoom in certainly, um, but when we zoom out, it's um, it's using a more a more pixel based technique, and so we, we have these various kinds of approaches to combining um, vectors and raster and other kinds of representations mm. um, for for navigating through large collections. So so this this gives you a sense of some of what some of what this the Sea Dragon technology does. Wow, um, and it's very general. We we have we have examples of this that are that are. Text that are little applets that are large images that are maps. We have some some very beautiful vector map demos. Excellent. Um, so it's a it's a real technology that has lots and lots of applications. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was that was where we started. Now a couple of months after the acquisition, um, I saw something really cool at TechFest, and yeah. it was a project that that started off as a um, as a PhD project. So this was Noah Snavely's. PhD project at University of Washington. Mm. He was co-advised by um, by Rick Zaluski at uh, at MSR, okay. and um, and Steve Seitz at University of Washington. Okay. And it was just a fantastic project. The idea was that you you take um, a collection of of images of, of uh, unstructured images taken in the same environment, 
So they, they took a bunch of images from, say, Notre Dame or the Trevi Fountain. They, they, they mined them from Flickr. So there were lots of cameras, lots of points of view. And, um, and they, they, they used some computer vision algorithms that were able to register all of those photos together into a, a common 3D environment. Mm. Um, I, I might have a snippet of video that shows you something, something of how the algorithm works. Is that sure, that would be fantastic. I think I remember seeing that at TechFest, actually. It was it was the most popular, the most popular booth at TechFest, I think, by a factor of two. So it really huh. captured a lot of people's imagination. And for people who don't know, TechFest Tech is our annual Microsoft research. Um, look what incredible stuff's going on, sort of internal exactly. event. So this is this is just a, a video of these guys doing a Flickr search and mining lots of pictures that are tagged to Trevi Fountain. Mm. And so there, it's just a, a, a mixture of all different sorts of images. Uh, this is an example of one of them. And uh, the algorithm works by finding a bunch of key point correspondences among those images and thinning those um, for, for consistency. And then it's able to reconstruct a three-dimensional model of whatever whatever that common environment was that those images were taken in. Wow. Those, those pyramids are. Um, are the camera positions. So it's not only figuring out what the three-dimensional environment was, but where the, where the cameras were as well. Wow. And then they built this browser that lets you browse through those images in 3D. Amazing. So it was, it's, it's really cool stuff. And, um, so it's all based on just putting points in space around an object in an image, in a 2D image? Well, the way it works is that given an image, you, mm -hmm. you can apply some filters to figure out which points, which key points in that image are liable to be um, well conserved across multiple photos. So things like like a corner of a window frame. Uh, you know, those are those are points in the image that if you if you photograph them from another point of view are likely to look pretty similar, even if the lighting conditions were different or the resolution was different. Mm. So it first identifies all those key points and describes them using a, a descriptor. And um, those descriptors in, in, in this case are these 128 dimensional vectors. And then and <laughs oh yeah, just 128 dimensional vectors, 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 of course. Well, you're, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky problem. What you're trying to do is make a descriptor that's going to be invariant to things like the lighting conditions and the camera and so on, mm. uh, and also the point of view, but, uh, but that's still going to be rich enough to describe a feature in a way that's distinct from some other feature in the same environment. Wow. So uh, once, you, once you have that, those, those features and those descriptors, you're able to reconstruct the 3D environment by just uh, saying, well, this feature in that image matches that feature in the other image. Mm. And here are the places on the, on the image planes where those features occur. If you now have, say, three of those, three features that match in two images, then that, that gives you uh, a, a really only a, only a single way that those, that those cameras could have been aimed in order, to, in order to see those three points. And it tells you what the geometry of the three points was as well. Very interesting. So, so that's, that's basically the procedure. Okay. Um, now, when, when I saw this, I, I, I thought two things. And uh, I think both of those thoughts have probably occurred to the, uh, to the, the MSR and UW teams as well, but, uh, but maybe not quite in the same form. One, one thought was, boy, this would be a fantastic mix with, with our technology, because, uh, of course, this really comes into its own when, when you do it in a distributed way, when, when you don't have to have all the hundreds of images all downloaded onto your hard drive so you're just browsing the environment locally, but instead you're doing it in a client server environment, just like the C drive technology. When all those images are are out there somewhere on the web, brought together as a collection, okay. and um, and now I'm able to use use a client and navigate through all of those remotely. Um, I mean otherwise otherwise to browse an environment like the Trevi Fountain you have to download a few hundred large JPEGs to your hard drive first. So now just so that I'm clear though, in the, in the example of Sea Dragon that you use, that technology, so basically I'm going out, I grab a random image from the web, mm -hmm. using your using your client technology, regardless, let's say it's just a 65 kilobit image, I mean it's not a super deep image, sure. not a lot of pixels. Yes. Um, I can still inter interoperate with it like you are. So in other words, I can still navigate into it. And you are going to do things to make it yeah, as nice as you can. That's kind of an interesting question. So um, it's um, well, to really answer it completely would require that we go a little bit 
a little bit more deeply into the architecture. Let's that please we probably go. Would. Let's please do it. You want to dive in? Absolutely. So, um, okay. The the size of images on the web mm -hmm. is right now constrained by the fact that you typically have to load the entire image before you can see it. Like there, there's a little bit of progressive image loading on the web, you know, those two past things where you see first the blurry version and then the, the refined version. Absolutely. But it's, it's pretty crude. Okay. Um, and most images are not progressive. Uh, that's why that's why images tend to be small. They tend to be 64K or something like that, 100 k You don't find 8 megapixel images on, on the web. Sure. Even though that's what cameras take. Yes. So uh, the other, there are two reasons for that. One is that you have to download the whole damn thing. So if, if, it's, a, if it's a large environment, if it's, if it's a... Um, if it's a high resolution image, then it'll take you a long time to load it, for the web page to load. The other reason is that that the screen is too small. Mm. Because web browsers are not are not tremendously scalable visually. You know, you, you generally only look at things at their original resolutions. Mm. That means that um, a, a large image isn't of much use either. And if it's an eight megapixel image and it's more than you can see on your screen at once, you you won't be zooming in and out of that picture in your sure. new browser. So, given those constraints, um, images tend to be small. When when we when we browse large collections of images, like I was just showing, mm -hmm. the way it works is that there's a there's a collection object, which you could think of as being something like a web page full of thumbnails. Okay. So it has low resolution proxies for all those images, mm -hmm. and that's why even if the collection has thousands of objects, when you first load it, uh, it, it it loads more or less instantaneously because it's it's like loading one. Uh, the coarse resolutions of one picture that has tiny thumbnails of everything. Got it. And then those resolutions are progressive. One thing that you, you might have noticed in that in that Sea Dragon demo is that when you first zoom in on something, when this thing first comes up, it's a little bit blurry, and then it comes into focus gradually. We use all kinds of tricks to, to hide that process, but, but there's this there's this kind of sharpening or focusing effect. Okay. So that works across entire collections with these collection objects. And then once you once you're uh, looking at an object in more detail, if you, if you dive into it or if you expand it, then it's going back to the original image and, and loading it at higher resolution. Now, if you have a, a 100 megapixel image, then you don't, you don't load the entire original image at once. Mm. You go to the original image and you load it progressively, too. I you see. load first the coarser resolutions, then the finer ones wherever you're looking. Mm. But uh, the lucky thing about, about plain old web images is that they're, they're so small, Anyway, that, that having just one level of detail when you dive into one of those in a collection is, uh, is okay. Okay. So that, that's, a, that's a perfect question. Excellent. So, so we have technology that, that lets us scale up to images that are really big if they're stored in, in progressive and multi resolution formats. Mm. Um, and uh, originally, when we were a startup, we were using JPEG 2000. There are other alternatives that have similar kinds of properties as well. Mm. Uh, but if they're ordinary web images, then you don't you don't need that multi-resolution for the final images. You still have that collection object that that handles the multi-resolution for for small scales for, for coarse resolutions. So the uh, so I, forgive my ignorance here. I'm not, not a specialist in, in, in uh, imagery. So an image file to me is just a bunch of you know bytes. It's just sure. a bunch of you know random things, not right. random, but they have meaning. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is for these multi, um, I can't remember the term you just used. Multi-resolution. Multi-resolution image, that's actually embedded in the information of the image itself. Right, so it's, a different, way, it's a different way of sequencing the information. Okay. okay, so if you have a, a, a file like a, a TIFF file, for example, mm -hmm. the TIFF files are, uh, the, the size of the TIFF file is the size of a header plus the number of pixels times you know three bytes if it's RGB. Okay. And it's just the pixels stored in reading order. You start at the top left, and you store the first row of pixels, and then the second row, and then the third row, and so on. So if I have a, a large TIFF file, like 100 megapixels, that'll end up being 300 megabytes, mm. say, if it's RGB, okay. and I stop loading it after the first 60K, then I'll have the first few lines, right? I'll the, the first few lines of the file, and, and nothing for the, for the rest of the image. Mm. So that's, um, that's in a way, not a very effective way of ordering the information. Sure. What you'd like is if you load the first 64K, you'd like a, a, a fuzzy version of the entire image. Mm. And as you keep loading it, you want, you want to holistically start refining it, start getting more resolution. Interesting. Does that make sense? So it does make sense. Imagine that you just take the image and you downsize it by a factor of two, say, and you downsize that one by a factor of two, and downsize it again, you end up with what's called an image pyramid. 
Mm. And now you store the the levels of the pyramid from from coarse to fine, that is from low resolution to high resolution. That's a multi-resolution representation. And if you do that the right way, you actually end up with a file that's smaller than the original sequence of bytes because um, well, because if you have large flat areas, for example, then the, the coarse resolution already contains all the information in a given region, and you don't have to waste very many bytes encoding the details there. So uh, that's multi-resolution. The other thing we need is uh, to be able to access a, a particular region at high resolution rather than just progressive in resolution. Right? Mm -hmm. We need to be able to zoom in on one little piece of a 100 megapixel image and, and see that part at high res without loading the entire thing at high res. Wow. So we need both multi-resolution and, and spatial random access. Does, does that make sense? It does make sense. Now the question is, the, what's the construct that, that I'm actually that, that I'm actually viewing? Are you creating a new image? Uh, basically, yeah. The, the the image that the client has in its memory isn't the same as the, as the original image on the server side. Okay. It's it's a sparse version, meaning it uh, it might know what the what the image looks like in its entirety at a very coarse level, mm -hmm. and it knows a little more about it at a, at a finer resolution, close to where you're looking, and it knows a great deal about it at, at an extremely fine resolution where you're looking uh, in, in the immediate vicinity of where you're looking. So Very it has cool. a kind of cone of knowledge about that, about that image. Great. It's, it's sort of like, um, well, a, a lot of these things are, are, are similar in some ways to the way, to the, way the, the brain works with, with with images, I mean, your sense of um, of, the, of the amount of detail in the visual world is um, is much greater than the actual amount of information that goes up the optic nerve. Mm -hmm. We have a, a fovea, which which is a really high resolution part of the retina, mm -hmm. and that's where we can read. That's where we can see really high detail. It's a very small region. Mm -hmm. We don't have the sense that that the resolution of the world is a lot coarser outside the fovea, but it is. Uh, we, it's, it's, uh, it's this kind of multi-resolution representation. We, we know we know about a very wide field of view at coarse resolution, mm -hmm. and about a very small field of view at high resolution. There's, and there's some intermediate ranges. This is sort of similar. Absolutely. So, I mean, did you do you guys architects in this world? I mean, do you study the eye and how that works? I mean, clearly you must. We're well, trying to actually um, reproduce it to some degree. Yeah. It's uh, uh, in fact. Um, uh, I, I'm not. I'm not really sure how much uh, uh, how much it's really had to do with my, my work in this field. But, but um, uh, my my wife and I. Well, my wife is the serious one. She's she's a computational neuroscientist, oh. and um, we we actually met um, at a at a course on computational neuroscience. Uh, we we both studied with um, uh, with a researcher, uh, Bill Bialik, who specializes in. in well, at the time, he was specializing in studying the fly retina oh. and uh, fly vision, and, uh, and so she's, she's done lots of uh, I've done lots of serious work on on, on, uh, on vision in real in real animals. I I've dabbled in it. Sure, but it's no doubt helped you to some degree in developing your your concepts. Probably, yeah. I, mean, I, I it might be more like just I, I'm interested in that sort of problem, and uh, certainly, uh, it's, uh, I, I've been interested in it from the biological angle at various points, and also. Very cool. So now, what what are you working on now? I mean, so now you're working uh, for Microsoft, so yeah, I'm assuming you're well, not building this thing anymore. Actually, we still are. Uh, there's, there's a there's a great deal that uh, that Microsoft can do with this technology, and it applies in a, in a, in a broad variety of of, um, of different areas. Um, some of which are probably pretty obvious from from looking at the demo and thinking about it. But, but uh, <laughs> the one that the one that's that's not so obvious is is the um, the, the mixture of Sea Dragon technology and this uh, and this photo tourism work from the UW and Microsoft Research. So we could we could go back to that. I can show you what we've done. Certainly. This is a, a tech preview that is um, going to be released in um, in a little while. Right? We, we don't have we don't have a definite date yet. Okay. But um, the the website and the video are going to be going live on Friday. So here's what here's what that looks like. That's, um, yeah, this is just to prove that I'm that I'm still writing code and I'm watching it from my development environment. So 
this is a collection of photos of um, of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. They were they were taken by by Jonathan Doogie, one of our guys, on a, on a trip to Italy a few weeks ago. Okay, and. Um, So we're transitioning among those images now, using using that same technology. Here's what um, here's what the 3D model looks like that was reconstructed from those images, and uh, you can see that there are all these there are all these little um, wow. cones and boxes. The, the, the boxes show what what images um, what these different images photographed, and um, and the orange cones show where the photographer was standing at the time. Wow. So um, if we Let's go back to this image, turn back on the cones, and you can see that there are some orange cones up here, which were, uh, this, is, this is when Jonathan went up to the top of the cupola and shot a bunch of pictures from up there. Let's, let's, let's take a look at what they look like. Oh, that was really cool. So this is, this is him, him standing at the top. And you see I'm just transitioning from image to image, but it has this really uh, sort of 3D look. It respects the, it respects the geometry. So how many images is that right there? Uh, well, here are all of them. <laughs> so you can see that we're using we're using a lot of that same Sea Dragon technology. Yeah. That's that's how these that's how these images are represented uh, with that same multi-resolution approach. Mm. Uh, so it, so this can now work over the over the network over over even a pretty narrow band connection. Wow. Same sort of experience. And uh, and they're all they're all fused together in this three-dimensional environment. That's fantastic. Here are those cones again. So let's 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 dive down to one of these pictures that he took in the <laughs> in the middle. Wow. Let's see, we're just moving from side to side in the space, but but we're doing it via via images. That is incredibly cool. And these guys can also can also zoom in and out, and we can we, we can support very high resolution images and so on, just like we can. In the in, in the Sea technology, it's, it's based on the same stuff. Sure. Let's take a close up of that. Wow. So it's a really interesting way of navigating through. I, I, I totally agree. It's an incredible way of navigating through pictures. I mean, basically, it's as though you're on the square. As opposed yeah, to looking at a, a series of pictures of someone that was on the square. Exactly. Well, it's a, it's a mixture. I think the really cool thing about this approach is that it's, uh, in a way, it's a slideshow, but but it's a slideshow that is also immersive. So it's it's, it's kind of halfway between a slideshow and a, and a 3D game, or some kind of environment that's actually immersive in the, in, the, uh, in that space where the pictures were taken. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it certainly has has interesting dimensions as as an experience. But it also uh, it also unifies those pictures and and, and gives this gives the uh, the sum of those pictures meaning and information beyond beyond just the, the sum of the parts. What I'm trying to say is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts here. Absolutely, it's an emergent system. There's a, there's something emergent here. That's right. You've you've taken all those pictures that are that are in the same place, uh -huh. and by figuring out the geometry and where 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 they were all taken. You now understand the relationships of all those photos to each other. Adjacent photos are are hyperlinked, in effect, mm. and you know where all the cameras were. And um, if uh, if, for example, you you tag one of those images, if I if I go and I and I tag the the clock and I say this is the left clock, uh, then all of the other pictures that also had the left clock in them would um, would receive that tag too. Wow. So. Uh, so it gives you it gives you a way of knitting together all of that information that has lots of implications for uh, for for search and for other kinds of problems just having to do with with analysis absolutely and content and images so so there, there are, there's lots lots to this that goes beyond just the experience of flying through the photos in 3D um, my my other thought when I when I saw when I saw this for the first time mm -hmm. uh, at TechFest was that. Um, Beyond beyond photo tourism, beyond just uh, you know here here are all the photos that I obsessively took of St. Peter's Basilica because yeah. not very many people would really take hundreds of pictures of the Basilica <laughs> from different points of view like that. I, it really gets interesting when you think about about uh, mixing together, about combining many people's photos mm. and and getting that emergent picture of the world based on based on all that photography. Wow. Uh, so if you think about taking the 
taking the, the registration algorithms, the, the, the algorithms that, that fuse together those photos into coherent 3D environments, mm -hmm. and putting them into, say, a web crawler that's going out there and indexing all the pictures on the web, yeah. then you start to get something pretty interesting. Absolutely, and especially if those pictures are, you know, tagged some way, so that's right. such that it knows it's part, it could be part of the system. Exactly. Because clearly, you're, the algorithm that you mentioned earlier is actually figuring out on its own certain constructs and putting pictures together, correct? That's right. It's not just somebody going, well, here's the one I took you know, at this angle and this angle and this angle, now put them all together. They could be in random positions. Oh, absolutely. And it yeah, figures it out. Exactly. The algorithm figures all that stuff out. That's so incredible. It is. It is. Uh, and, um, and, it, and it means that, I mean, I've, I've always been a little bit, a little bit skeptical about tagging because, uh, per se, because it, it just seems like a very low leverage sort of thing to do. You know, if I if I tag a particular rectangle in one of my images, it, it doesn't go beyond that image. It seems like a very work intensive way of sure. adding meaning to my okay. photography. But if suddenly one person tagging one image somewhere mm -hmm. with some details, you know, if it's a, you know, if it's a picture of a fresco, and one person has taken the time to to tag all the various saints on it and so on. If suddenly that means that those tags propagate to everybody else's photo that included that fresco, then that's 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 a lot more interesting. Totally, kind of like a global jigsaw puzzle. Exactly. With uh, you know multiple people putting it together. Exactly. It's it's something it's something Very emergent that comes from just the photos and and it allows bits of meaning that come in through one end or another to to propagate through the whole system. Even even photos that aren't tagged mm -hmm. have have emergent meaning just from their context on the web. But we do an image search, mm -hmm. the, the text on the web pages is being used to figure out what the meaning of the photos was. That's why if I type Notre Dame into, uh, into A9 or something, I, I, get, uh, I get a list of images Certainly. of that because, because of, the, of, the, of the textual tags that are just coming from the web pages. Very cool. So you think about all that cross-linking. Yeah, you know, it's you get amazing. A pretty interesting picture. Oh, absolutely. Interesting picture. Created by, you know, potentially thousands of different cameras. Exactly. Different exactly. experience, different angles, different... Very interesting. Now, you know, for the developer perspective here, of course, the question is, you know, how can I leverage this and use this in my application? You know, is there is there, is there an API, is there a layer, is there some way for me to take advantage of the great work you've done and your team in doing the hardcore engineering and now saying, all right, sure. you're presented with an API to play around and extend. Well, we're a little we're a little behind with that part. <laughs> so, that always comes um, last, obviously. Well, hopefully not last. But we, we we're very I mean, especially at Live Labs, we're really concerned with uh, with with getting those kind of network effects. Mm. So we uh, we really want to open to open up some of these APIs and let mashups and development on top happen. Uh, so it's it's high on the list of priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, we have at this point um, probably two different APIs that we'd like to be exposing eventually. One to the Sea Dragon architecture in general, and another specifically to the kind of uh, to the kind of linking and geo registration that would be enabled by by this photosynth stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I can't I can't tell you anything definite about when we, sure that's when fine. when that's uh, when that's going to happen. But it's, it's but you're it's thinking about it. You're the architect, so that's good news. It's certainly right. in the pipe. It's a very high priority for us. Very cool. Now back onto the architecture of the of the product. Um, you're not using the the .NET 3.0 technologies. Uh, are you? No. Uh, when we were acquired, we were using uh, OpenGL 1.1 and C++. And uh, we're now using DirectX and C++. Okay. And uh, we're, we're still using DirectX. DirectX uh, in fact, I think we, we may still be using DirectX 8. We wanted to really build this on as, um, as widespread a platform as possible. We didn't want to, to impose barriers to entry. Certainly. So, um, in theory, this stuff could probably run on a Windows 2000 box. Nice. Well, don't, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be quoted on that. Yeah. Certainly, any any XP box will be able to run this. Very cool. And you know, it would be possible to build, probably with a fair amount of work, a managed programming layer on top of this. Yeah, that's, that's right. exactly what that's right. you know Avalon is doing. They're writing their layer on top of DirectX. Exactly. Right. You don't have to. 
go right in and direct that. You don't have to be an architect with a PhD as yourself to be able to do things like this. No, I, I never quite finished my PhD. Well, you sound so like it. <laughs> Certainly you're building great stuff. But I mean, the point is you're an expert at that DirectX programming level, which does require... I don't, I don't know so much DirectX either. <laughs> oh, no. Man, that's strike two. Let me see if I get this one right. <laughs> well, no, but, but you're But you see right. what I'm saying. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's, um, it, DirectX is hard to program against in native yes. code. It just is. Mm -hmm. um, a lot harder than OpenGL as we've as we've found out in the past few weeks. Okay. Um, yeah. The, the hope the hope is that we, we have this we have this engine underneath that's built using um, using simple using simple moving parts mm. that, that are that are very common and um, and I guess in some ways legacy they're, they're they're not it's not modern it's not using the common language runtime or anything like this mm -hmm. and uh, we we hope to make it easy to hook up that engine. Which, uh, which was really designed for wide compatibility and, and high performance. Okay. So there's nothing managed in there at all. So uh, to make it easy to hook that up to, to higher, to higher order constructs, more modern things. Sure. Which clearly is the, where the, our platform, the future is going for programming. It seems. Right. Um, but you know, managed C++ is pretty amazing as well. The latest version of C++ is pretty impressive. I've done a few interviews on that, but that's orthogonal. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's synergistic. I mean, I, uh, when when you're concerned with with coding, uh, well, and I, I know that this is also in in, in in very rapid motion. This whole field is is, is, being, is developing very quickly now. But uh, my sense is that it's still going to be a little while before, say, high performance game developers switch from using straight unmanaged C++ to yeah. uh, to, to writing high performance games in managed code. Uh, there's there's still just a little bit more performance to be eked out, a little bit more generality, a little bit closer to the machine, mm -hmm. and um, and this is a little bit like a game in that sense. We're really operating pretty close to the, to the hardware. Um, the the difference is that a game is a is a generally a closed system, although Xbox Live may be changing some of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's a fairly closed system, and, and here we want to make it an open system. So we want to we want to create those those APIs, those sockets that let uh, that let managed code, that let high order stuff connect. Very cool. Now, so you're programming against the GPU. Yes. Right. So, um, how do you handle? So you mentioned that one of the interesting scenarios was this, the notion of distribution, which clearly was about I'm going to want to have anybody's going to want to have in a web environment, right? So I do a search, and I want to be able to grab all these images in parallel. So, you know, are you guys doing a lot of work with, with asynchronous uh, web request type stuff? And yes. Okay. Uh, in fact, the, <laughs> the, the current generation of Photosynth, our, our, our builds as of last week, mm -hmm. uh, we're working exactly with those kinds of asynchronous web requests. Okay. That, that, that is the, the, the back end that we're working against. Very good. Um, Cool. Yeah, I just did an interview with the coordination concurrency runtime people. And they've developed uh, uh, an excellent model for writing uh, several, you know, parallel processes happening simultaneously. You know, obviously in parallel, but in a much easier way than dealing with the threads directly. They have a whole they've abstracted things away nicely, and they're using the notion of coordination and ports and stuff like that. It's, very cool stuff, but you only, yeah, only get it in managed code. Yeah, that's you only get it managed code because they rely on generics. Um, you could say, well, you got templates in C++, but they rely on 2.0 of the framework to do what they do. Well, from, from what I've seen, there are a lot of there are a lot of really interesting tools that I've sometimes wished um, that uh, we had easier access to but that, are, that are now being, being done for managed code APIs. And it looks great. You know, this, this, stuff looks, uh, <laughs> this stuff looks great. Um, so. Who knows? We, we may be doing a managed code rewrite in, in a couple no. of years. <laughs> I, I hope. I hope we don't have to. <laughs> you probably don't have to. No way. But that looks really great. So, and this, we don't know when this is coming out exactly, which is fine. We don't. We don't. We don't know about exactly. Dates. That's right. Um, there, uh, as I said, the video and the website are going live on Friday. This Friday. This Friday. Okay. Very soon. Uh, and I, I think it's safe to say that we'll have a tech preview in the fall with okay. with a bunch of hand collections. Cool. Um, well, I'll try to get this video out on Friday then. Excellent. That would be good. Well, uh, anything else you want to tell us about this technology? Uh, I don't know. It's too open-ended a question. <laughs> I, I, I've probably, You're an I've architect. You live with open-ended questions. Fair enough. 
I've, I've probably gone gone about to the about to the limits of what we really uh, what we really should be talking about <laughs> at this point. Fantastic. Uh, so, uh, I, it, it's, it's it's my feeling that this this um, this approach to images really has the potential to change the way we not only the way we interact with 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 our own pictures and with the pictures on the web, but uh, the way we think about the web itself. Mm. You know, Pictures are ubiquitous on web pages. Absolutely. The picture, the pictures on web pages are connected to the content. Mm -hmm. If you think now about uh, about relating geometrically and geographically sure. all of the pictures on web pages with each other, mm -hmm. that forms links and connections between the web pages that, with a little imagination, you can uh, well, you can think about how that how that how that might really change your experience, Absolutely. how you how you browse the web. Using those photos as portals and other pages and so on. Wow, I mean, it's it's like taking this. Remember the vermal thing? Yeah, exactly. It's taking that to a whole new dimension. It right? is. I mean, clearly, several dimensions. Well, and and, and the um, it's an, it's an interesting comparison. Uh, I think that one of the big problems. Well, there are a lot of problems with vermal, of course. Mm -hmm. But one of the worst things about it was the authoring story. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not it's not very it's not very compelling when in order to make something like that happen, a, a 3D experience happen, you have to um, you have to you have to go through an exercise in, in CAD. You know, that, that guarantees you that, you're, that not very many environments are going to get made. You know, so it's, it's a little bit like what um, uh, what Yahoo started off as the you know uh, the idea was there was going to be a directory of the whole web. It was like uh, like the, the encyclopedia of Dubero and Alimbert, you know, this attempt to try and, and, and catalog all of human understanding from the top down. Yeah. And uh, one of the lessons, I think, of, of Web 2.0 and, uh, and the kind of thinking around that mm. is that you really should be trying, to, should be trying to, to leverage what's already there and put it together in, in interesting ways that, that come out of the content itself. Absolutely. That was, that was really what... Um, I think what Google's big insight was in, in, the, in their search engine, and sure. uh, and so this is uh, this is like a step in that direction for for images. Absolutely. Well, I'm really looking forward to seeing this uh, when so it comes much. out. So and and uh, do you have a, does your team have a blog or you know, blog age now? So sure. way for customers. Oh, you can't not have a blog. Right? Yeah. So like yeah, we're we're going to have one on the Photosynth site. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody has actually put any entries in it yet. We could put sure. heads down to try and Fair enough. Get, our, get our first release on. But, yeah, but, we'll be but when I put this on Channel 9, you'll become a Niner, right? right. Maybe spend a little time answering some questions if, sure. if you have time. Sure. And, well, uh, I always have the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll be blogging. Excellent. Very cool. Well, hey, thank you for your time and nice to meet you. Thanks a lot. You too.